Hi, and welcome to Synchronicity, talk radio for your mind, body, and soul. I'm your host, Marie Bernard, and if you or someone you care about deals with anxiety or panic attacks, especially panic attacks, then you're going to want to listen very closely to today's interview. Today, we are speaking with Tom Bunn. He's a licensed clinical social worker, and he's the author of Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia, which is the result of his many years of addressing flight panic in his role as an airline pilot. He's also a licensed therapist, regular contributor to Psychology Today, and a former U.S. Air Force captain who flew the Air Force's first supersonic jet fighter, the F-100. You can visit him online at panicfree.net. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you very much, uh, Marie. It's really a pleasure to be able to get the, the word out that we can really do something effective about uh, panic. Absolutely. Uh, I've had panic attacks myself, and it can be really terrifying. Uh, and you literally feel like you're going to die. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing, too, because when you get cognitive therapy, one of the things they try to get you to, to <laughs> take in, maybe more than just take in, is, well, look, you know, panic is just panic. It's no big deal. It's not going to kill you. Yeah, but you <laughs> that's, that's not what it seems like at the moment. So it's... Uh, you know, I, I, that's speaking of cognitive, I, I didn't realize that cognitive is not that effective. Hmm. Uh, what we were doing with the airplane, we were running at least 80% effective in terms of stopping panic. And with people I spent, a, you know, focused on a lot, we always got it fixed. Some, you know, some people didn't, didn't spend that much time working on it. But it was, we fixed it. We could fix it. And, and meanwhile, it turns out that when you look at the stats, cognitive says it's the gold standard for treating panic. But when you look at the stats, what they call being effective is response. Any, any amount of response, virtually, they consider good. But only 17% of people actually become panic-free from cognitive. And, and I think the reason is obvious. When you have a panic attack, you've got no cognition available to do cognitive tools with. That was what I found on the airplane. I tried for years to get cognitive to work to stop panic on the plane. Could not do it. So having found a way to do it on the plane, I think it's time to do it on the ground as well. Well, that sounds uh, like a really good success rate, the fact that you were able to help like basically 80% of people. Um, so I'm curious. Now, I've had my own panic attacks, and one of the things that helped me is after – suffering from panic attacks enough times I started to learn okay this is a panic attack and I could catch it before it mm -hmm. got into because once you're in full-on panic mode you pretend I mean I, I had one uh, I was driving and I hydroplaned and I felt a panic attack set in and if I didn't have the wherewithal to calm myself down I actually could have been in physical danger while driving yeah yeah. So what's the difference between, like, I had a few really bad panic attacks. Now I can calm myself down through breathing and just going, okay, this is a panic attack coming. You're going to be okay. What's the difference between that and people who aren't able to do that and need more help? I think that the key problem is something that there's a well-known psychological theorist in, in England, Peter Fonagy. He, he has a term called psychic equivalence. Psyche meaning the mind and you know what equivalent means of course what he means by this term is that what the person has in their mind is as far as they're concerned exactly what's real no question about it and ordinarily when we um, have something in mind we might uh, we might question it a little bit we might uh, critique it to make sure it's accurate but when we get under stress we sometimes stop doing that so for example, a person might have um, a pounding heart, and they might have the thought, "Oh, I wonder if this is okay. I wonder if this is a if this is a heart attack." Well, if they just stop at that point and say, "Well, it it might be. Maybe I'll better get it checked out," they don't have a panic attack. On the other hand, if the thought that they might be having a panic attack triggers enough stress hormones to shut down the capacity that we have to separate imagination from something that's real, uh, we go into what funny calls psychic equivalence. We believe that what we have in our mind, even though it starts as a thought, now it becomes a certainty. 
and we just believe we're having a heart attack. And then that sets up the possibility of panic because you can't run away from a heart attack. So the two things I think that compose the panic attack is you think there's some great danger that you're in, and you can't escape it. Because if you can escape it, you'll get rid of the panic attack. But the other thing is you, you've got to believe that there's something seriously wrong. And I think maybe how you found your way out of having panic attacks was you were able to see as you were starting to edge into it that it wasn't a certainty. What appeared to be a problem was not a certainty. You, you, you had some doubt about it. It's when you lose doubt and you're sure that you're having the heart attack or whatever it is, that's when you can go right into panic. Mm. Well, I have had um, what I'm assuming was a panic attack where I managed to stay calm. I, it didn't escalate, but mm -hmm. and I went to the doctor, um, but my, I was still having all of the symptoms of a heart attack mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. you know, even the pain in my arm and all of that, because my belief was maybe I'm having a heart attack because I'm I'm doing all the things right to, to alleviate the panic attack and it's not stopping. So maybe this really is a, a heart attack. Yeah, exactly. And, the, you know, the only way you can be sure is to have some tests done. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I've, I've put in the book is that, okay, we're talking about panic free, but talking about stopping panics is, but wait a minute, let's make sure that what you're dealing with is really panic, not that you're not having some kind of heart problem. So you need to talk it over with your doctor and find out if, if we talk about panic or if there's some problem with your heart that uh, you haven't really checked out. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. So can you tell, take us a step back to, um, I think it's really cool that you were fighting or flying the, the jet fighters and stuff. Did you ever get panic while you were <laughs> flying or was this just because you saw your passengers having panic attacks? Well, back when I was flying in the Air Force, I remember having a panic attack. <laughs> what happened? When you're in training, um, you're flying a little propeller-driven airplane that goes maybe 120 miles an hour, and it's a two-seater. You're there in the cockpit, and you've got this complete son of a bitch in the cockpit as your instructor. They <laughs> just have this ability to use the foulest language that you've ever probably not – you haven't even heard some of it. And they just sit there and just yell at you for the entire flight. It's stressful. <laughs> so – I, I remember that it, it was the, the first day he gave me the controls of the plane and I started to fly. And he says, what are you trying to do, kill us? So it, it, <laughs> you, you spend six, seven, eight sessions, one hour sessions flying with your instructor. And what I was seeing was that in training, these guys who had now gotten up to about uh, eight sessions and they hadn't soloed, they were dismissed from the program. They were washed out. So here I was coming up to my eighth session with the instructor, and he, I land the plane. He says, okay, I've got the plane. He wouldn't even let me taxi it. He drove it over to the edge of the tarmac, and he shut the engine off. And I thought, oh, this is it. He's going to come and tell me I'm finished. So he got out of the cockpit. It was a front and back thing. I was in the front. He was in the back. He got out on the wing, came up to where I was, and he says, okay, Tom, I want you to go up and um, – and, and go up in the uh, maneuver area, and I want you to do a stall series and some barrel rolls and uh, some aileron rolls. Don't do any loops. Um, and then fly around about 20 minutes, do something you want to do, and then come and make uh, one landing. No touch and goes, just full stop landing. And he walked off the wing of the plane, and I was still sitting there saying, I'm finished. I was so sure <laughs> that I was finished that even though he had just told me to go solo, I didn't get it. Hmm. until finally as he was walking over toward um, the edge of the where the planes were parked, I saw him do something I'd never seen him do. I saw him smile, and that kind of broke the spell. And I realized, wait a minute. So I was kind of on autopilot, and so I did my checklist. I started the engine, taxed it out, did my radio call. He told, he t he'd actually laid all these steps out. I was like hypnotized. Took off. Went up and did the maneuvers he told me to do. But you remember he said, do something you want to do for 20 minutes? In this program, it was so intense that I hadn't done anything for 20 minutes that I wanted to do in, in weeks. And suddenly it realized, it, the realization hit me. I'm in this plane all alone, and I have to land it, 
and I don't know how because he's been telling me for days I don't know how. Oh <laughs> so, God! <laughs> so I had a I had a panic attack. But the problem was, well, you don't have any you don't have anything to do except say okay. There's if even if I don't know how to land the plane, there's nobody in this cockpit who knows more about it than I do. So I guess I'm going to have to try. And so it actually worked out. So it was a very strange thing to to suddenly have a panic attack on your first solo flight. Wow. But the thing is, you know, you, you when you have to push through it, then it's different than if you end up having a situation that you can't run from. I think if you if you have a situation where you can escape, then panic probably gets more of a ability to get to you. Mm. But if you if you have no choice but to push through and and get past the panic attack, then I I think that sort of breaks it. And that was unusual situation. I don't know whether that works for any other type of panic. Uh, that's interesting because I think that um, yeah, like if you can escape, then it gets reinforced. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea. Okay, I panic. There's nothing I can do but escape. So I've got to escape. Yeah. Yeah, I think the the first time that I had a panic attack and successfully was able to de-escalate myself, I was on a packed train um, on a here we have Canada Day it's kind of like the 4th of July yeah. um, so it was packed public transit and I realized okay if I don't calm myself down I'm going to start throwing up right here uh -huh. on the train I, it's going to uh -huh. be a really bad uh, medical emergency so and I was standing up so immediately I asked someone I was like I hate to do this but I need to sit down I'm going to faint. And so I sat down and then I breathed. And then that the first opportunity, I was able to get off the train and calm myself down. But if I hadn't been in that situation where I had no choice but to take care of myself, uh -huh. maybe that would have kept reinforcing. Well, it's interesting. You're talking about, you said, you know, I need to sit down. Otherwise, I'm going to faint. Because <clears throat> when you get really hyper aroused, um, you can get hypo aroused enough that you have a bounce back effect and you go very hypo aroused and your heart rate goes way down and your breathing rate goes way down and there's not enough blood supply to the brain and you could faint or pass out. Uh, and then <clears throat> when you get into that kind of state where you're in, in shutdown, anything that you hear or do actually just exacerbates and keeps it keeps you stuck there but if you just sit and do nothing it goes away hmm. well we're going to talk about that in just a moment we are speaking with Tom Bunn. He is a licensed clinical social worker, a former Air Force F-100 jet fighter pilot, and he's the author of Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. You can find his website at panicfree.net. So, Tommy, we're just talking about doing nothing, and then it goes away. Well, what? Let me, let me just throw something that it, 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 it's not net. It's, it's, um, it's uh, uh, panicfree. Uh, dot, um, Oh, no, you're right. You're right. It's, I sort of say it's not .com. Yeah, you're right. It's dot .net. Panicfree.net. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay, so, we, so we're switching to... You, you, I, I interrupted you about what you were... You were just saying about uh, doing nothing and then it goes away. Well, yeah, the, what happens is when you get in that shutdown state, anything that comes in exacerbates it. And if, for example, my, my wife has a grandson who's on the spectrum, and what we found when he goes into the shutdown state when he was three or four, anything we try to do to bring him out of it, it pushed him farther into it. So we just found that the only thing you could do is let him kind of, the stress hormones burn off so that he goes back to normal. Anything you do at all, it just uh, makes it take longer. Mm, so it adds so I, to the remember, overwhelm. <laughs> yeah, I remember we went to a, a store and he had one of his meltdowns lay down on the floor. And, you know, you might think I'm embarrassed. We've got to do something about this. I would just say, well, I can't stand here so nobody steps on him. And in about 30 seconds, he gets up. But if we had done anything, he would just stay there uh, endlessly if we tried to intervene. Mm. 
So can we talk for a second about the role of oxytocin in panic attacks? Because I this is new to me. Yeah. Um, what happens is that when you produce oxytocin, it inhibits... Well, it's, there's a couple, we, we used to say it inhibits the release of stress hormones, but the, the, it, it, what we do know is it does shut down the fear system, but we're not sure exactly how it does it. There's different controversies about it. But in any case, when, for example, when a mother's nursing, she produces a massive amount of oxytocin. And in that state, she can't get anxious about having thoughts, oh, I've got to stop nursing the child and do something else. This is how nature protects the child's getting the nourishment it needs because nursing takes a while. Um, <clears throat> so oxytocin does two things. It does shut down the fear system one way or another. <clears throat> it also causes bonding. So when you hold a newborn child, you get oxytocin to make you feel protective of the child. <clears throat> also in sexual afterglow, oxytocin is produced to cause bonding between the two people in case there's a child that develops, the child's going to be better off with two people taking care of it rather than one. And <clears throat> also in good sexual foreplay, the fear of getting physically close goes away. Um, also dogs look at us look like a lover does, like you're the only person <laughs> in the world. Who, I'm totally devoted to you. That also produces oxytocin. So those are five things that we can use if you've had any one of those situations. What we can do is say, okay, let's say you have panic about um, an MRI machine. So you make a list of the things that are going to happen from scheduling it to being finished with it and everything in between. It might be a list of 15 or 20 items, step by step by step. And you want to take each of those steps and link it to the memory of a time when you produced oxytocin. As silly as it might sound, you might have a photograph in your mind of uh, heading toward the facility where you're going to get the MRI, and you just made love, and your lover's holding it by his or her face. Or if you have nursed a child, bring back the memory of where you were seated, the room, what you were wearing, what the light was like there, and then begin the nursing experience in your mind, reliving it, and then pretend there's a photograph there, black and white, so it's not too lively, of going to the MRI facility. So that's how you link it, link it up to those, si those situations that can trigger us, by taking the situation that can trigger you, breaking it down into step by step by step, and linking each step to an oxytocin-producing situation. So this, Tom, just to clarify, this is long before you ever are getting the MRI, you're preparing this in advance? Uh, right, because if you go back to what we talked about with panic, you want to install a program in your mind that will work even when you start to move into a state of panic. Because when you really are in panic, you don't really have very much mental ability. You can't say, oh, this is what I should do when I'm in panic. That doesn't work. You've got to train your mind to take care of you automatically. For example, people who do really high-stress jobs like policemen, firemen, people who work in emergency rooms, when they get into these life-and-death situations, their mind is kind of fried. They don't think very clearly. So how do they perform? They train prior to being in that situation. They have canned procedures. Well, if you're in the emergency room and this happens, Step one, step two, step three, step four. So let's do those steps hands on. Okay, there's another thing that could go wrong. Here's your steps for that. And you learn these and practice them, actually going through them mechanically. And then they get installed in a part of the brain in the subcortex, which is not bothered by stress hormones. The cortex, the thinking part of the brain is. But the subcortex isn't. So when your thinking part of the brain goes south on you, the subcortex with its unconscious procedural memory that you've where you've installed your program it comes in and takes care of you now most people will say i don't know anything about unconscious procedural memory but anyone who buy, who, who who drives a car does if you go back to when you first learned to drive a car it wasn't easy you had to concentrate but as you concentrated on it it got easier because your unconscious procedural memory was beginning to take on some of the roles some of the task and then finally you're now able to go driving down the road and have a conversation. 
without paying very much attention to the driving. Because that part of the brain that will take care of you in panic is taking care of you as you go down the road. The question is, how do you, how do you program it? Just by repetition, just like how you programmed it to learn to drive your car. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, here's the MRI. You've got a couple of dozen steps of the whole process, maybe. Maybe a dozen, maybe somewhere between that and a two dozen. So you break it down into all these little steps and link each one of them to a situation where you produce oxytocin. Now, that's to shut down the fear system. We're going to get in also probably to how you can activate the calming system, which is the same exercise but linking to something different. Mm. So there's when, a difference mm -hmm. between shutting down the fear system and turning on the calming system. They're not exactly. the same thing. Right. That's exactly right. Stephen Porges, who was a neurological researcher, um, discovered by accident that when he had, he had some people he was ex doing research with who were hooked up to heart rate monitors. And what he was researching was how much the heart rate changes when you breathe in and breathe out. You see, when you breathe in, you have a new supply of oxygen in the lungs, so the heart speeds up to transport it. But then after a few seconds, it's transported. Now you breathe out. Well, the heart doesn't need to beat so fast, so it slows down, maybe as much as 20 beats per minute while you're breathing out. Breathe back in, it goes back up by 20 beats, maybe 80 beats per minute. You breathe out down to 60. So that was what he was studying. And that change in heart rate is produced by activation or deactivation of the vagus nerve. Now, what he was interested in was the vagus nerve quality can vary from person to person. And it can also vary depending on the age. For example, a preemie has a very not a not very good quality vagus nerve, and so here's the potential for sudden death, uh, infant death syndrome mm -hmm. with uh, the problems with the vagus nerve. So that's what he was studying. Anyway, he had the subjects hooked up to his equipment, and sure enough, they breathed in, the heart rate went up, and they breathed out, it went down. But then something surprised him. A friend walked by, and suddenly the heart rate went down. He thought, what's going on here? So that put him into <laughs> the other thing he was interested in, or has become interested in, what he calls the social engagement system. That when we're with other people, he says, without knowing it, everybody is sending and receiving signals that are picked up unconsciously. The first thing that happens when you meet a new person, you get a shot of stress hormones that revs you up. There's some level of ur urge to back off or get away from them. But our high-level thinking is going to perhaps override that by saying, well, the person looks okay, so I'm not going to just run away. But if you hang in there with them a few minutes, you're going to start picking up their unconscious signals, and that is going to calm you assuming they are safe to be with. <laughs> but the calming could go past just physical safety. You know, there are situations where we're in social situations. We know we're physically safe. So we're getting some stimulation of the calming system. But we may not be psychologically safe. People may be competitive or critical. They may not say anything, they, but you sense they're judging you. So you, you don't get the full calming. But let me ask you, have you had a friend who you sometimes felt your guard let down when you're with them? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's happening when you feel your guard let down is the parasympathetic nervous system, the calming system, has gotten fully stimulated by the signals from your friend's face, voice, body language, and touch, if there's touch. And those signals come across unconsciously and are processed by you unconsciously. And the only thing you know is your guard let down. Involuntarily, it's not something you can make happen. Your vagus nerve got so stimulated, it slowed your heart rate, slowed your breathing rate, and went through all the organs in the gut and says, there's nothing you need to be concerned about. Everything's fine. Just do what's normal. That's when you feel your guard let down. So it, ideally, that's the person to link to for going into an MRI to calm you, we've already talked about how you can link going into the MRI to get oxytocin to keep from getting stress hormones. But this overrides any stress hormones you might get. The face, voice, and touch will 
override the stress hormones. In fact, Porsche just calls it the vagal brake. He explains it this way. If you're in a car with an automatic transmission and you put your left foot solidly on the brake, even if you pump more gas into the engine with your right foot on the accelerator, the car doesn't go anywhere because in a car, in a car, the brake is more powerful than the accelerator and the engine. Actually, he says, the same thing is true of humans. The vagus nerve can override any amount of stress hormones. But the question is, how do you activate it? So if you have a friend who you felt your guard let down with, that person's face, voice, and touch can override any amount of stress hormones. So what we do, we run through the exercise linking first to their face. We have them hold an imaginary, in our imagination, we imagine they're holding a picture of the MRI situation by their face. Then <clears throat> to link to the signals in their voice, you talk with them about the photograph as you look at it together. And then while you're talking about it, your friend just gives you a reassuring hug. Now, you might say, well, <clears throat> this friend is not going to be with me. I'm going to be on my own. Can a memory of a person really do that? Research came out just this year from the University of Arizona where they took 102 people who were in committed romantic relationships. And <clears throat> they were going to put them individually, one by one, into a stressful situation and measure their response. They had them hooked up to equipment. The stressor, <laughs> interesting, the stressor was putting your right foot into two inches of 38-degree water, cold. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't sound terrible, but a couple of people actually dropped out of the experiment. Um, so now the question is, what can we do to try to help you calm yourself? while your foot is in this water and this is a stressful situation. So the first group they had, they said, as you are being in the stressful situation, distract yourself by thinking about what you did today. So they checked them. The second group, they said, think about the person you are in this romantic relationship with. And they looked at the results of that. Now, the third group, they actually had their romantic partner physically present. So you know that having your physical, your, your partner physically present is going to be helpful in dealing with this stress. Mm -hmm. But what was surprising was that the people who simply thought about their romantic partner did just as well. Mm. So this makes it very clear that if you, you take this person who you have these calming signals and when you're with them and remember being with them, it's just as effective as having them beside you when you go to the MRI or when you go on the plane or when you go through a tunnel or so on. But it actually, and I think you'll see why in a moment, it's actually more effective to have them built inside because if they're sitting beside you, you might have to have a conversation about what's going on. But inside, when you program them inside linked directly to the challenges you're going to face. When you start to face those challenges, when the challenge just begins to become a, something your unconscious can be aware of, but your conscious can't quite get it yet, your friend's going to be there fighting it off at an unconscious level, and you may never even be, a con be conscious of any stress. Your friend may take care of it completely at an unconscious level. That's what we find out happens on the plane. Hmm. People get on the plane and they think, I'm, I, they think I should be completely in a panic state by now, and, and they're not even feeling anxiety because they have linked someone who's important to them, so profoundly calming to them, to the door closing, the plane taxing out, taking off, etc. Thanks, Tom. Now, I'm curious, cause there is an epidemic of loneliness in our culture. So what about people who don't have close friends or significant others? What might they be able to use as an alternative? Well, this is tricky because maybe we should say this is a good reason to rethink relationships because we are creatures of relationships. So much of our Actually, all of our dialing regulation comes from other people. It's just a question of whether it's someone with you or someone who has been with you that you've built inside. Other than that, um, a pet. But um, if it's hard to have the kind of relationship that you want, maybe it's good to try to have a relationship with someone whose job it is to do relationship, a therapist. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. We are speaking right now with Tom Bunn. He's a licensed clinical social worker and author of Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. You can find his website at panicfree.net. Um, so we've been talking about calming ourselves and stopping the, the fear response. And I totally just forgot what I was going to say. That's one of the things, actually. Th- so this is what yeah. I, I've just recently yeah. started doing stand-up comedy ah. to overcome my stage fright. And what happens is I get up there, and if I get some kind of trigger that creates, I mean, I, I feel the anxiety at just the thought of going on stage. But what tends to happen sometimes is I'll forget everything I'm going to say. Uh-huh. Um so I guess, I mean, should I be picturing someone I care about before I go up on stage? Or but I also want to stay confident and I feel like maybe uh, picturing someone I love might put me in more of a sleepy state. Well, I think you could, if you can, go to the venue before anybody's there and, and find some objects that are going to be in the room. Uh, you know, for example, a chair would be occupied, but something you could see. And link that person who your guard lets down with, with that object. For example, when occasionally I've had a student pilot get afraid to continue his pilot training. And I say, okay, um, let's go to your checklist when you get in the cockpit. You put your hand on the throttles and check that it's in the cutoff position. When you put your hand on the throttle, I want you to, when you have your hand on it, Think about being with this person who your guard lets down with. And then the next thing is you check the ignition switch. When you put your hand on that, think about, so see, see what we're setting up. So find something in the room that you'll be able to see when you're doing stand-up that's going to link, that you're going to link as you look at it with the calming person. Mm-hmm. Then when you're there doing stand-up and you start to feel like something could go wrong here, go find that object. That object is connected to that person. But the second thing I want to mention is that sometimes we have a hard time accessing the, the sequence of words we have in mind. And one kind of trick that you can do is see if you can find a way to take the thing that you want to say and make a visual object of it that you could say, well, there's this tree and it's got a roots in the under the ground and it's got a... Uh, this co- part comes out of the ground and this, this branches and the greenery and all that and it's shaped kind of like a cone so if you you don't have to memorize that speech if you can come up with the object so if you can find a way to take what you're going to use in your comedy and find some way to picture it so mm-hmm. you can talk about it that is a more substantial way to hang on to it than try to remember the words you're going to use so like picture the scene of the story I'm telling mm-hmm and then you might also just for another piece of safety memorize very carefully the first five or six words you're going to yeah use. that how i i know the first the first bit and the last bit it's just sometimes okay, if go. i forget that. That was, yeah. yeah yeah that's a good yeah. one too yeah okay. cuz if you don't yeah if you don't know exactly what you're going to start out with it's like oh my gosh we're in panic yeah <laughs> yeah okay Man. <laughs> So why do you think that this it, that it's more it's important for more people to to learn about these these techniques? Well, first of all because we we need to be able to have relationships and sometimes having trouble with panic gets in the way of a relationship. Um Sometimes we look to be in a relationship with someone who's calming and we want them to calm us all the time. Well, they can't. You know, they're people too. So we need some kind of internal resource if we're going to be able to maintain a relationship. So very possibly, you mentioned the epidemic of loneliness. It may be that we don't have enough built-in resources. So if we can find in the past a person that we did have a relationship with, it doesn't matter that they're no longer with us. If we had a time when we did have some good moments, we can go back and link to those good moments. It's, I think it's kind of like if you have a jar of peanut butter, you can spread it on a lot of crackers. You can spread it on as many crackers as you want. If you've got just one person in your life, not now even, 
but sometime in your life when you had the feeling of your guard let down, you can use that on any number of things that you need to control anxiety about. If you've got one situation where you produced oxytocin with a lover, with a baby, with nursing, with uh, a, a pet, you can take that and spread it on all of these situations. Hmm. Beautifully said. Thank you. So we're, we're talking about um, nursing and babies, and it sounds like, and maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but it sounds like you're saying that panic attacks actually stem from uh, young children not getting quite what they needed. Yeah, exactly. Because I think this is the way it works. When you're born, of course, your revving up system is mature. Any, any baby can scream bloody murder, but it has no ability at all to calm down. So what happens? The caregiver, usually the mom, let's say, is going to, when the baby's upset, present her face. We do this intuitively. Soft, loving eyes. And talks to the baby. And the baby doesn't understand what these words mean yet. But the baby's calming system reacts to the quality of the mom's voice. And touch, the touch comes across and calms the baby. So this is going to go on for months. At around 18 months, somewhere in there, the baby's brain, of course, has developed tremendously at that point. And now, when the child gets upset, has learned that, oh, when I start crying, mom's in another room. Oh, she's going to hear me. She's going to come in here. Okay. So as the baby gets upset, or now as a child, let's say a toddler, gets upset and starts knowing that mom is going to respond. He starts imagining, starts anticipating her. He's going to see her come around the corner and he's going to see her face. Ah, that's nice. I feel better already. And she's going to say, honey, what's the matter? Ah, I love the sound of her voice. And she's going to touch me. Ah, it's delicious when she touches me. So what happens is the child's anticipation of the mother calming him activates his calming system. Now, if mom does come in and says, honey, what's the matter? And sees that, oh, wait a minute. What do you mean, what's the matter? You're fine. Well, I'm here. I'm going to give you a hug. I'd anyway. love to give you hugs. So she reinforces the child's expectations. And if this happens a few times, it becomes a program so that whenever the child gets upset, the child automatically calms down. But what happens if mom comes in and sees the child is okay and says, hey, you don't need me. I've got stuff to do. I'm out of here. She doesn't reinforce it, and it doesn't become a program. Mm. So it, it appears that about 60% of us build in a program so that whenever we get revved up, we instantly calm down, at least to a level of curiosity. What's going on? Whereas maybe 40% of us don't have that immediate down regulation. When we get a shot of stress hormones, we stay revved up until the stress hormones burn off. And that's because when we did calm ourselves down, we didn't get that reward that reinforced it. And so, it, so it didn't get rewarded. It didn't get reinforced. So it didn't become a program that's active today. Hmm. It it atrophied back around eighteen to twenty four months somewhere in there. Interesting. So oftentimes people say, "Well, what caused panic? What what is it that triggers it?" Well, we know what triggers it. The question is. Where's the calming that's supposed to result? Look, when your cell phone rings, it's intrusive. When the amygdala fires off stress hormones, it's intrusive. It grabs our attention. But when you answer the phone, it quiets down so you can have a conversation. What happens for the person who has panic issues, I think, is when the amygdala fires off the stress hormones and you become aware of it, you stay stressed. It's like having a cell phone that when you answer it, it keeps ringing, and you still have to have a conversation with all that noise going on. You know, it, it, back to airplanes for a moment. The, the, when, the most serious thing that can happen on an airplane is an engine fire. And so in the simulator, you practice it again and again and again until you could do it in your sleep. But I can still tell you what the procedure is, even though I haven't flown a plane in a long time. Hmm. The first step in dealing with the um, the problem. When the engine, when there's an engine fire, there's a <clears throat> there's a sensor in the engine the cell that picks up the heat. So <clears throat> when that sensor picks up that there's a fire there, there's a light, a red light that lights up in the cockpit, and a bell that goes off. It's really loud. You can't miss it. 
when that bell goes off, the first thing you do is push a button to silence the bell so that you can talk to the other pilot and you can coordinate the steps you're supposed to do. You can't do that if the bell stays ringing. So that's kind of how we're supposed to be wired up. Yes, we're supposed to have the amygdala get our attention. Suppose you're focused on something really intensely focused and, the, and a threat does arise. You need the amygdala to be able to release stress hormones that will hijack your brain and pull you away from what you're concentrating on to deal with an, a problem. So we need that. But now what we need also is to immediately be able to calm down from alarm to curiosity so that we can do a good job of determining, is this a real emergency or a false alarm? And if it is a real emergency, what can I do about it? But for a person who has a panic problem, they stay revved up. And even if there isn't a real problem, they, because of their feelings, they believe there is a real problem. And they go into a state of panic because the imagination of what the problem may be becomes experienced as no doubt this is really what's happening. Hmm. I'm just, uh, yeah, there's so there, it, it's all so complicated and yet simple at the same time. Like our, our fight or flight gets triggered and some of us just aren't able to put that on the back burner so that we can focus on sa solving yeah. the problem. Yeah. And the way we can put it on the, 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 <laughs> the black burner, the back burner is if we can have this circuitry built in that will automatically calm us. So here's what we can do. For the next few days, first thing we need to do is find a person who has that calming effect on us. Now, some people have had the feeling of their guard let down so they know that they've had it. Maybe they can remember who it was with. If you can't remember who it was with, think of being a, with a person you feel really comfortable with. If you haven't had the experience of feeling your guard let down, just think about being with someone who's non-critical, non-judgmental, re really accepts you just as you are so that you're really comfortable and not walking on eggshells ever with them. Okay, you got that person in mind. Okay. Now, as you go through your day, if it's like most people's days, there's going to be no shortage of times when you get stressed. So instead of trying to block it out, turn it around and look for it because you want to pick it up at its lowest possible level so that you can perceive it. And immediately bring to mind your friend. Imagine that your friend just walked in the door, says hello to you, and comes over and gives you a hug or whatever you know, is proper for your relationship. So here's what we're doing. Arousal, we want arousal to trigger the appearance of your friend's face, voice, and touch, which will calm you. In other words, by practicing this a few times today and tomorrow and the next day, you're going to put in that calming system that we missed out on at 18 months. Every time you get revved up, you calm down because you've trained yourself to bring to mind your friend's face, voice, and touch. Hmm. Now, would this work? I've I've been practicing um, meta meditation, loving kindness. Mm -hmm. It it feels like it might be kind of similar to the idea of picturing the face of of the loved one of. Are you familiar with meta meditation? Um, not, I may be, but I don't know it by that name. The loving kindness. So picturing uh, someone that you love and saying, may you be safe, may you be happy, may you live with ease, may you awaken to the light of your true nature. Uh -huh. um, uh -huh. So you go through that process and then that's supposed to trigger, I'm guessing, like oxytocin. Well, I think what's happening is that that's that's a two-way street with your friend. You're both giving that way of being with them as you're having them be that way with you. And <clears throat> this is this is the, when you say it may trigger oxytocin. There are experiences that both cause oxytocin and vagus stimulation, and this may be one of them. Sometimes a person will talk about. Um, a moment they might link to is their wedding vows. And that might be one that would produce oxytocin and vagus nerve stimulation because your beloved is accepting you just as you are. But there's also that sexual chemistry involved with them. Mm -hmm. So can we can we go over again just to clarify the difference between the oxytocin release and the vagus nerve mm -hmm. stimulation? Okay, so let's go back to the 
car. You got the accelerator pedal, you got the brake pedal. Yes. We want to block the accelerator pedal. We do that with oxytocin. The amygdala is the part of the brain that releases stress hormones. It, at least one version of the, of the dynamic here is that oxytocin prevents the release of stress hormones. It may be a little bit more complex than that, but that's that. As long as we say, when we produce oxytocin, we're going to prevent the release of stress hormones or them having an effect on us. We're not going to get revved up, so we're going to block the break, the, the accelerator pedal with a memory of an oxytocin producing scene. That's to keep from getting revved up. Now, to calm down in situations where we nevertheless get revved up, perhaps by some surprise, we want to use the face, voice, and touch of a person who is completely accepting of us because the person who is completely accepting of us is sending us signals that we pick up unconsciously that activate the vagus nerve, slow the heart rate, slow the breathing rate, and give us that complete relaxation in the in the organs in the body okay so the oxytocin so the va- the stimulating of the vagus nerve is slowing the heart rate and the right. and the breathing which is a little bit different that all that the oxytocin is doing is blocking those stress hormones well you mentioned breathing you see <clears throat> and, and and steve poor just talks about this he says, you know when you breathe out your heart rate slows down and one thing you can do to calm yourself is very slow exhale and then inhale quickly and then breathe out very slowly but I don't think that that's powerful enough to do the job that we need to do with panic because what we can do if we bring in a person whose face voice and touch calms us that's going to do it continuously so in order to get the brake pedal to work your friend's face voice and touch is going to hit the brake pedal in order to keep the accelerator pedal from being operated, nursing, holding a newborn child, sexual afterglow with your partner, that interaction, sexual foreplay where the chemistry is good, and interacting with your dog. Or, well, I started to say cat, but it depends on the cat. Some cats <laughs> look at you like, what have you done to me lately? That's not the cat that's going to do the job. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so we have just a few minutes left on the show. We have been speaking with Tom Bunn. He is the author of Panic Free. I'm trying to get the entire title of the book here. The 10-Day Program to End Panic, Anxiety, and Claustrophobia. So before we wrap up, uh, you mentioned this um, picturing the the friend that we care about, the friend that triggers mm-hmm. the oxytocin. So mm-hmm. for a few days, we're looking for triggers. What Can you give us a couple of the, what the 10-day program, just sort of a brief summary of what that's going to look like? Well, in the program, we spend a few days working with oxytocin. We spend a few days working with vagus stimulation because you see they're same exercise, just different things we're linking to. So we want to make sure a person gets those both mastered. You got to find the oxytocin producing scene and link it up you got to take to find the situation that activates your vagus nerve and this calming activates a calming system you need to link that up so as you can see it could be a little confusing so we say okay for the first three days we do one and then the next three days we do the others and then the following days we do a little bit of both but somewhere along the line we also want to do what i explained when you go through your normal day, every time you start to get revved up before you do anything about it, bring in your friend, have them come in the room, greet you, come over and give you a hug. So you get their face, their voice, and touch. Those three things that activate your calming system, you build it inside so that every time you get revved up, you get revved down automatically. Beautiful. And and you mentioned finding an object in the room. Is it possible, because sometimes you you don't know what kind of surroundings you're going to be in. Can you mm-hmm. carry around a little object? I, that's an interesting idea. I, I, that should work. If you, well, let me, you know, one of your props, are you going to be using a mic, for example? I will, and I own a microphone that's similar to every microphone that would be on stage, so. <laughs> okay, then maybe you could do both. You could <laughs> for the next few days. Do an exercise where you link that microphone to oxytocin production. I don't want to get x-rayed and say how you can do it. (laughs) I know. That was the first thought I had, too. Okay. (laughs) Okay. All right. 
and then <laughs> you could also link it to a situation with your friend who you feel uh, your guard let down with. You could imagine that the two you have a microphone and you're going to do uh, something together. They could make a recording from some kind. So you, you, your friend uses it, you use it, um, you talk about it, and as you start to make a recording together using that mic, you feel your friend's arm around your waist give you a hug. So I think we got something new there. You can link it up to the mic to take care of you with oxytocin production and with vagus nerve stimulation. Beautiful. Something definitely to, to experiment with and see how it goes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and Tom... Then also, you've got, you may have a glass of water there. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's one of the props, right? And a stool, maybe? Yes. Okay. Possibly the lights. There may be a few possibilities that are always going to be there. What would what would the lights? That's an interesting. Well, because the lights are kind of problematic, you know. They they're intrusive, mm-hmm. and they're they're not comfortable, and they keep you from being able to see your audience. You know, I, I, this is a situation not unlike um, one that a client called about a few months ago, because he had been working not as a supervisor, but as a, on the same plane with other people. So when he was working in a, in a group, uh, he was getting good signals from the people he was with. But he took a job in a different city, had to move, and now he's a supervisor. And he felt very stressed because now he wasn't getting any good signals from the people he was interacting with because he's their boss. So here you are in the in the stand-up comedy situation. And you know sometimes you're not going to get good signals, sometimes you are. So we need to have some other source than the audience when the audience isn't giving you what you need. So there you've got your microphone. You might want to link the lights also to vagus nerve stimulation and to oxytocin production production somehow, as well as uh, the microphone, the glass of water, a a, a stool if that's one of the props you're going to have. Cool. And does it always have to – so does it have to look the same? Because, I mean, if in a different place – Things like stools are going to look a little bit different. Yeah, they, they, they may look a little different, but they're pretty generic. So I think that might be. I would try to link. See, I would try linking to the, as many possibilities as you can that would be there. And even if the stool is going to be different enough, it doesn't work. You still got your microphone. You still got your lights. Um, got your glass of water. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So we have been speaking with Tom Bunn. He's a licensed clinical social worker. He's the author of Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia. His website is panicfree.net. So what do you feel, Tom, is the most important thing that you want to get across to listeners today before we close? Well, first of all, that that we can fix it. Um, Many people have tried to... To, to deal with this and not getting good results. Um, and, and then we kind of talked about it because when you use cognitive approach, hey, when you start to have a panic attack, you don't have much cognitive ability to do cognitive tools with and uh, may not work very well. That's what I found on the plane. It doesn't work at all on the plane. Um, so if you haven't had success, give it a try. I think that you've got a good shot at it here because this stuff is based on the way we're wired up. Beautiful. And so in 10 We're days, to produce oxytocin. Yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah. the the people that have had up to about 80% success rate, have they just gone through the 10 days or is, is the 10 days just give you the, the building blocks and then you have to keep working at it? Well, the people I've worked when I was at 80%, I'm talking about when I, the people I've stopped panic with in a really difficult situation being on the airplane where you have no control, no escape, you're up high, separated from all kinds of things. It's a difficult situation and you might have turbulence as well. So when we can stop panic in that situation routinely at 80% and virtually 100% if somebody really wants to work hard enough to make sure that we cover everything, um, we know that we know this stuff works. Now the question about the 10 days is this is something that I worked out with my editor because we figured that a person who has panic really needs to have very concrete step-by-step-by-step by step by step things to follow. So that's why we laid it out as a, it's a step-by-step program. Beautiful. So it sounds like t- in 10 days, if you really work this, you're going to see a noticeable difference. Uh, not only 
noticeable difference. You may find a remarkable difference because, what, like as I said, what people, when when I work with people on the about flying, they really say, "I'm going to get on the plane. I don't trust this is going to work. I'm afraid I'm going to have a panic attack." They get on the plane and they are mystified that they don't have a panic attack. They don't even get anxious. Hmm. This is. You know, as I said, this is how our karmic system works. It is activated by other people. The question is, do we have someone with us to activate it? Or do we take someone who has activated it and remember that situation and apply it like opening that jar of peanut butter and putting it where we need the crackers uh, fixed up with with the peanut butter? We take the situations that are difficult for us and we attach that person's presence to it the exercise. Beautifully said. Well, again, we've been speaking with Tom Bunn. The name of the book is Panic Free, the 10-day program to end panic, anxiety, and claustrophobia, and his website is panicfree.net. Thank you so much for to Tom for being with us, and thank you for spending this hour with us. I hope that it's been valuable to you. Be well. Namaste. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much. <laughs> cool. So that'll air on uh, next Monday. All right. Very good. Um, there was, oh, yeah, I know what I want to mention to you. Do you I don't know if you know this guy, Willard Scott. I don't think the he's alive The name sounds familiar. Willard Scott, he used to be an announcer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he was maybe Jack Parr era, something, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe, uh, maybe somewhere after that. Anyway, he was phobic. And he became president of the Phobia Society of America for a while. Wow. And he, he said his biggest fear was that he's going to be there with the camera, the television camera, live television, pointed at him, and the camera's not on. And then he's supposed to say something when the red light comes on. And his fear was the camera's at him, the red light comes on, he opens his mouth, nothing comes out. Been there, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and so... He said the way he got around it was just going ahead and imagine that it happened. Mm. And then what if it happened? He just stood there with his mouth open, nothing coming out. And finally, they turned off the camera and he got fired. <laughs> so that's what happens. He went through the whole scenario. <laughs> What's the worst going to happen if it happens? So that, that seems to help him. <laughs> yeah, he still lived. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Tom. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening. You too. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.